Welcome to Peri Out Talk. I am Dr. Lisa Spruce, Senior Director of Evidence-Based Practice at AORN. And I'm pleased to welcome Amber Wood, Senior Perioperative Practice Specialist, to discuss our guideline on sterilization. Amber, welcome to the show. Thank you. I think this is such an important topic. I think it's the foundation for infection prevention principles. And so I'm so grateful that you're here to, to discuss it today. Can you talk about what prompted the review and update of the um, guideline for sterilization? Sure. Thanks, Lisa. It is actually absolutely essential for infection prevention. And so we knew there were some things we needed to add to this guideline. We have these 3D printed devices that have prevented presented some challenging uh, sterilization scenarios. So we wanted to provide guidance for that. Um, we wanted to address the practice of short cycle sterilization. We also know that there's challenges with transporting sterilized items between facilities. So we wanted to provide some more direction for that. And then we have a new guideline from the ANSI Amy ST108 about water quality. So we knew we needed to update our recommendations for STEAM quality and water, water quality monitoring. So we knew all those things needed to be put into the update so that everybody knew what was the latest and greatest. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Those are great topics. Who did you have as key stakeholders in your guideline development process? Yeah, we had the guidelines advisory board, of course, who is our team of members who help us. And then we have individuals from our liaison organizations. And we had a lot of support from the Healthcare Serial Processing Association or HSPA. And then our infection prevention colleagues from APIC and SHEA were also really engaged and helpful in the process. Oh, that's great. Okay, good. Tell me what are the most significant changes to the recommendations for different sterilization methods? Yeah, so there's not a whole lot of changes to actual practice, but something that was new was this concept of short cycle sterilization. So we added a definition for this. This is a common practice in eye centers. And so we went with the definition that aligns with CMS. And so that definition is for a sterilization method for a Raptor contained load. And it has to be sterilized in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions and it needs to include a dry time. And then that packaging of the sterile barrier needs to be able to permit storage for use at a later time. So those are the parameters that CMS puts around short cycle sterilization. So we just wanted to clarify what that practice is and add some recommendations around it. So that's something that people may not have heard of before or not seen in ARN guidelines before. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's great. I'm so glad you added that. That will help so many people. And then have we recommend I know you have the recommendations for monitoring and validating sterile processes. Did those get updated as well? Yeah, so monitoring is still essential. There's really not any big changes in the monitoring world. We really just wanted to make sure we stress how important it is to review those physical monitors, your sterilization parameters, and then also to check those chemical and biological indicators. We did get a request during public comment, which we love to get, and just a request for a simple table just to help readers quickly identify the recommendations around doing those routine biological tests to test sterilizer efficacy. So we added that table to like help users easily navigate the guidelines for the monitoring. Um, and then we do have, as I mentioned earlier, there's new water quality monitoring recommendations. So that is new. And um, there we're talking about monitoring the water that supplies the steam generators or the boilers. And so this is to align with the new ANSI Amy ST108. And it's really important because the quality of the water that's coming in to supply is going to affect your steam quality and purity. So it's really important that we get that right. Yeah, I have to tell you a story. There was a, a, one of the facilities that I worked in no one, they opened the sets of instruments, but no one checked the, the indicator to see if it had gone through the process. And so they noticed it at the end of the case that the indicator had not turned and they ended up operating on this patient with unsterile instruments. Wow. So I think we can't overemphasize how important it is for our uh, periop nurses to check those and because things like that can happen and they do happen. So 
I remember this surgeon having to have that conversation with the patient, which wasn't fun, but I think it just emphasizes the fact that those kinds of things can happen and how important those indicators are. Yeah, absolutely. We have to keep educating and make sure that we're all knowing what's the best practices and protecting our patients. Yeah, oh, sure. sorry that happened. That's I know. Terrible. <laughs> no. Um, well, let's talk about those challenges because implementing is always a challenge for almost any process. So how can healthcare facilities effectively implement what we've been talking about, especially the updated portions of our guideline? Yeah, so anytime there's a new guideline comes out, the best thing to do is just go through it and do a gap analysis. What are we doing? What are we not doing? And have your leader help you. Like, what's the priority? Where where do we need to get in alignment? And for sterilization topics, it is heavy on regulatory. So you definitely want to start anywhere you're not in compliance with your policies or any of, of the regulations for sterilization. Um, so for one example, for something that's new in the guideline is the transportation between facilities. If you're doing any of that uh, offsite sterilization, or maybe you have clinics sending uh, sterilized items back and forth to the main facility, um, you need to make sure you have a team together and that you are knowing what your regulations are for the U.S. Department of Transportation and OSHA. I think OSHA we're familiar with, but Department of Transportation may not be as familiar with. So they have a great website with information and we've cited that in the guideline as well. Um, so your team needs to look at those transport vehicles you're using. And um, we have recommendations uh, to check the cargo area. Is it, is it cleanable? Can, you, can it withstand the disinfectants that you need to use to clean it? Um, is the environment controlled? You know, are we in a trunk? Are we in a van? Can we control the temperature, humidity? Uh, can you separate clean and dirty items? That's really important to have enough room to do that and have carts um, in containers that can allow that separation. And then something that's new people may not be as aware of is minimizing movement. Like how do you reduce shock and vibration on the instruments? Because think about it, when we get new instruments, they come to us in the shipping packaging, then we put them in containers and we send them back and forth and they don't have all that protection. Um, so our instruments could get damaged, um, especially those fragile instruments and anything electronic, right? So it's just really important that you look at your manufacturer's instructions and have the team get together because you may not have clear guidance on this. Um, the, there is a group at Amy working on some guidance. Um, so we've added a little bit um, to help with that. But really, it's just going to come down to your team just coming up with a standardized process and looking at your local conditions. Like, are you in a really humid area? Are you in a really dry area? Do you have weather issues uh, and exposure to the instruments and things that you need to take into account in your local place? So hopefully that helps some folks with that new recommendation. Yeah, I think those are questions we don't always think about on a day-to-day -day basis that is a discussion that can be had with those teams. What are the potential challenges in implementing those types of changes? Yeah, so that's a lot. And, and there's a really great article in the AORN Journal in your July 2020 issue. And this, um, this facility, they went from having their sterile processing in two different hospitals and moved it to a single offsite center. And they described their whole experience and everything your team needs to consider. So I definitely like to point people to that because they talk about their challenges and they talked about how they implemented it. So like they talked about how their logistics, like how are they going to do it? All the steps involved. Uh, what are financial implications? Do you need carts? Do you need containers? Um, where are you going to do this? What's the location? Are you going to have space, space for holding, space for transport, uh, all the regulatory stuff we talked about? How are you going to mitigate risks? And then pl contingency planning. What are you going to do if it doesn't go according to plan? And how are you going to get those instruments where they need to be? And so in the end, this team decided to use a third party for, to do transportation because there's so much regulatory and tracking. Um, and they had all that expertise and software and were able to do that. But that article, July 2020, ARN Journal, it would be so helpful. Yeah, what a great resource. Thank you for that. So we're thinking about all these great things. Tell us, what do you think is the anticipated impact of these updates on patient outcomes? Well, I'm an infection preventionist, so I want to prevent infections. 
right? And, and, and to do that, we need effective and reliable sterilization processes. So um, that's just really the goal of the guideline is just to make sure that every patient gets the same level of care every time. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And how does the guideline address common concerns or misconceptions about sterilization? Mm. You know, one common concern is immediate use steam sterilization or IUSS. We used to call it flash sterilization. And how safe is it? And we were really excited to see a study that they found that IUSS was safe when they used the manufacturer's instructions and AORN guidelines. Like it was the best uh, plug ever uh, for following the guidelines and the AME guidelines as well. And so that includes like complying with protocols for the whole process, not just the sterilization piece, but also the cleaning and decontamination, how you handle it during sterilization, and then getting it to the sterile field. Um, and reviewing those IFUs, what are the parameters for immediate use ster steam sterilization? And are you verifying that your sterilizer met those conditions? And then they logged and tracked the reasons for IUSS and traced it back to the patient for surveillance. So when you do those things, um, it can be done safely. And so that was really encouraging to see. Yeah, that's great. Well, this has been wonderful, Amber. This is such crucial information about sterilization and I wish we could talk an hour about it. It is, it is, can be quite complex. So um, I want to let everybody know that this guideline is available now in the EG Plus and also in our 2025 print guideline books and our eBooks. So thank you all for joining us today. We hope that this has been a helpful discussion for all of you and we will see you again on Periop Talk. <music>